So our first work of the day is called Stadia 2 by Julie Maretu. So the title here is informing us of the subject. You might notice when you're looking at this piece that it's relatively abstracted. We're certainly seeing um, references to the expressionist movement from a couple of decades prior. This subjective representation of an objective reality. So we see a stadium filled with this abstract flurry of action in the center. We see all these leading lines, a lot of which are kind of swirling around the center right here. Um, we also see this confetti that's falling from the ceiling that's represented by these shapes in this area. And then we also have these shapes on the top third portion of this work that are intended to represent international flags. So you can kind of see a couple of them um, represented less abstractly over here. We have kind of like representations of the American flag over here. We also have these shapes that are intended to represent kind of like these pennants. Um, if you've ever been to like a swim meet um, or another sports event, sometimes people will have these rows of flags. So um, this piece is part of a greater triptych, so a grouping of three artworks that explores the concepts of nationalism and revolution within the context of art, sports, and contemporary politics. So this piece is really representing the notion that the contemporary world is cosmopolitan. There's lots of different cultures and people and traditions that are interacting together in the modern world. And this is, um, as we saw with previous pieces, facilitated by things like um, mass transit, um, travel, and things like the internet. So this cosmopolitan nature of the modern world, of course, is represented by all these flags over here. Um, we also have the, the sense of movement and action that is conveyed through the use of these um, lines. They're not necessarily parallel or perpendicular. They're kind of leading the eye around the canvas, creating this sense of action. Um, we also have this subject of the stadium. So stadiums are these very large public places where people can express national pride. So we have things like sports games. We also have um, stadiums as places where people can express their ideas to the public. So think of it like a political rally or some sort of other event where people are coming together to share in a common ideology. Um, there's also references here to the um, events like the Olympics, this international competition, um, this notion of like people expressing their national pride through competition and so on. So the artist is making several references to the constructivist movement as well, which is focusing on abstraction and creating a artwork that is divorced from the context of history. So you're wiping the slate clean, you're starting off without any of the burdens of historical references and creating a collectivist society. So it's really difficult to convey in these slides, but Maritu's work is typically very large. Um, here she is on a lift um, in a church in Harlem producing this massive work just a couple of years ago. So a lot of her works are massive, they're of large scale. You can see the pile of um, rags that she's using to blend the colors um, on the floor here. So she tends to work at a very large scale. Ngachi Mutu, who um, was born in Nairobi, Kenya, trained in Europe, and now works out of New York City. So she's similar to other artists that we've seen, like El Anatsui, Aninka, Shonibare, and that they are individuals that um, were born and raised um, in the continent of Africa, and then at some point in their life, um, continued their training in Western Europe, um, and then are now working in a more cosmopolitan city. So this notion of hybridity, this um, mixing of different elements together, um, different cultural and historical influences, um, different places, um, et cetera, is something that um, Wangechi Mutu um, expresses explicitly in her artwork. Um, and these works in particular, and in many other artworks that we've seen 
seen um, from individuals that follow this kind of like same kind of like life trajectory is this um, focus on like post-imperialism, the consequences of the scramble for Africa and the kind of like ensuing independence movements and political turmoil um, and kind of like identity crises that a lot of these communities are having. So um, we have themes of post-imperialism that are certainly present here. Um, and we also have this kind of like consequence of um, post-imperialism and of like the cosmopolitan nature of the world. Um, that the specific element of that that is referenced here is the um, kind of the, the objectification of the African woman's body um, and a lot of the stereotypes that are associated therein. So um, Wangechi Mutu as an African woman um, focuses on this kind of like convoluted stereotype in her work pretty frequently and also focuses on it here. So there's one kind of like element of this um, of this stereotype, one facet of the stereotype that deals with the seductress. So this seducing figure that is somehow um, alluring but dangerous. So she has this alluring gaze and posture. Um, she has arranged herself in a way to look presentable to um, an audience. Um, she has these long legs. Um, there's this kind of like suggestion of modesty, but at the same time, like nothing is really left to the imagination. Um, she also has this um, snake entwined in her fingers here. It's kind of difficult to see, um, but of course, course, whenever you see a snake in a work that has heavy Western influences that's typically associated with the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve and the temptation um, of Adam. Um, so there's also this um, facet of the stereotype that deals with the wild. Um, the title, of course, is alluded alluding to this stereotype, um, praying mantra sounds similar to praying mantis, um, which is this um, insect that is particularly famous for engaging in sexual cannibalism. So basically during intercourse, the female of the species will sometimes bite off the male's head and feed on his body um, to help nourish the eggs that are being fertilized by his headless body. Super fun. Um, so the modeled skin of the figure is also concealing and camouflaging the figure in this very busy background here. Um, so this element of like blending in with your surroundings and being one with your environment is also kind of like a part of this kind of like wild um, stereotype. Um, the figure is also um, involved, also has these um, bits of like photo montage collaged on top. Um, we have lots of animal parts. You can see some wings and insect legs here. Um, this uh, medium of collage that is oftentimes used in Mutu's work is um, intended to explore the concept of hybridity, um, of the mixing of two seemingly unrelated things or places or influences to create something new. So um, referenced in the use of collage, you're taking a bunch of seemingly unrelated things and you're, you're mashing them together to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. So this use of collage or photo montage is something that first gained popularity in the Dada movement. Um, the kinds of imagery that Wangechi Mutu utilizes in her work um, typically involve things like medical literature, travel magazines, fashion, and even pornography. So because of the source material of this work, particularly with respect to medical literature and pornography, a lot of her work tends to take on a more disturbing and like physically uncomfortable um, presence to it. So um, these are a couple of the pieces that I thought were like appropriate enough to incorporate in this presentation. Um, her work is fantastic and very provocative and imaginative um, and beautifully executed, but I do um, advise exercising a word of caution if you do a Google image search of her work.
So um, Wangachi Mutu and Julie Meretu are members of this movement called Africa's Out, which is this um, organization that provides grants and support for um, artists, um, particularly those of African descent and members of the African diaspora um, and members of the LGBTQ community, um, kind of like when that intersection of those identities with funding and support. Um, this video talks briefly about kind of like this organization, what it's about, and what um, kind of gives you some kind of insight as to what one of these gatherings looks like in New York City. Our third piece of the day is Shibboleth by Doris Salgelo. So um, Salgelo is a Colombian born artist. A lot of her work focuses on the history um, of Colombia, um, particularly within her own lifetime. So um, one of the things that is starting to happen in her country um, throughout her lifetime is this pattern of violence, conflict, and mourning. Um, this installation in particular involved this um, extremely long crack in the floor of the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, which is a particularly famous installation location. We will actually see other works um, in the curriculum that are um, presented in the Tate Turbine Hall. So Tate Modern is one of the kind of like most well-known contemporary art museums in the world. It draws a very international audience. So um, this crack in the floor starts out hairline thin. You can barely see it um, in the top left-hand corner, but as you walk along the length here, the crack becomes larger and more pronounced before it finally diverges into these two separate arms here, and the crack becomes over two feet deep and several inches wide. So um, a lot of students struggle with this work due to its conceptual nature. Um, one of the things that helps inform us of the purpose of this work are the, um, the commentary that the artist, of course, has provided herself, um, as well as the title, shibboleth. So shibboleth is this term that is used to describe an indicator of foreignness. So um, typically, especially with members of immigrant communities, um, there is this... Um, this distance between members of these immigrant communities and the more established kind of like local communities that are living in an area. So one of the ways that that foreignness presents is perhaps in the way that the um, that the immigrant communities will wear things or um, pronounce certain words. It's just basically like an indicator of foreignness um, and therefore something that um, is creating distance between these communities that are occupying more or less the same geographic area. So um, these differences are implied to accumulate over time and eventually result in this crack that is difficult to cross, this, this physical distance that is difficult to reconcile. So um, there's also an, a, the suggestion, too, of like this physical scarring on the environment, how a lot of these communities are ostracized and separated um, from the kind of like greater local community um, and made to feel different. So Salgado actually conceived of this piece as a representation of exclusion experienced by um, non-European immigrants in Europe and how these non-native communities are singled out and inevitably segregated um, when they arrive in these new places. Um, so um, as a Colombian artist um, working in European spaces, um, Salgado has actually experienced this herself. Um, which adds some additional meaning to the work. So this installation is particularly significant in that it involved permanently altering the space in which it was installed. So for most installation artwork, there is a space provided, you set up your piece, um, it remains there for a designated amount of time, and at the end of the installation, it is deconstructed, and then the space is returned to its... Um, its previous state. It's as if the artwork was never there. So this piece was different. So instead of taking out these massive concrete slabs at the end of the installation, um, they were actually left there um, as the floor of the turbine hall and the crack was filled in. 
So when you look at a, a view of the turbine hull today, you can actually still see the scar of this crack in the floor. Um, and this is particularly significant. It's representing that healing as possible, but that erasing the past and erasing the pain that is caused by like ostracizing communities is never something that really goes away. Um, I like to compare this to that um, kind of like that anecdote of like a person like hammering nails into a post and then removing them. Like you can inflict pain and then remove the thing that causes pain, but at the same time, there's still holes in the post. So this is a really interesting video that was produced by the New York Times a couple of years ago talking that talks with Doris Salgado and um, provides a couple of examples of her artwork and kind of like the ideology behind these pieces. These are two installations that are um, that took place in Colombia. One is about the coup that happened in this particular building. It was this political um, usurping that was particularly violent. Lots of people died. And she's representing kind of like this chaos and this disorganization um, that happened in this like relatively mundane looking building by having these chairs suspended on the outside. Um, this other piece right here was an impromptu exp um, ex exhibition that she did um, on the streets of her hometown um, that she enacted, that she participated in and kind of initiated after a notable kind of like uh, I believe it was a journalist was murdered. Um, so this piece was um, talking about like the grief and mourning that was associated with um, that event and how the entire community was mourning the loss of this person.